It's hard to believe that the SEC's 100th anniversary is slowly creeping up on us. I know it's still a dozen years off, but still, that seems close compared to the 60th anniversary party I attended that felt, feels like it was just yesterday. <laughs> Today on Zippy Point. Quick Zips by Zippy Point. Quick and dirty. I'm Brock Romanek, and I'm a big fan of yous. So here are eight things about the SEC's birth that you didn't know. In the wake of the stock market crash of 1929, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had Congress enact the Securities Act of 1933 without a single dissenting vote during his famous first 100 days. Securities issuance were not regulated before this. There was felt like there was no need to regulate securities offerings at all. And of course, this was one of the major causes of the market crash. There was so many people just issuing stock in companies that really didn't exist. Lots of fraud happening. The 33 Act back then was well known as the Truth in Securities Act. Not a lot of people know that. The original draft of the 33 Act would not have required it audited financial statements. Hard to believe. Without audited financials, I'm not sure any of that fraud would have ever been cleaned up. The drafters of the 33 Act were all part of FDR's inner circle. Felix Frankfurter, the leader, who went on to become a member of the U.S. Supreme Court, James Landis, who became the second SEC chair, Benjamin Cohen, who also had a hand in the 34 Act, and Thomas Corcoran, the leader of the New Dealers, who also worked on the 34 Act and eventually fell out of favor with FDR. Registration statements under the 33 Act were required to be filed with the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, because the SEC didn't exist until a year later when the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 was enacted. Wall Street, of course, was not happy about this at all. Many of the old dealers thought that their practices would continue, would prevail, even though the 33 Act was enacted. And in a protest of the 33 Act being enacted, many Wall Street firms refused to bring new issues of stock to the market. This February 1934 article from The Atlantic called it a famine of new issues. But eventually, the due diligence defense helped ease acceptance, at least amongst the corporate lawyers, the Wall Street lawyers. because And these Wall Street lawyers were key to a change in the we need to stay unregulated mindset that permeated the market at the time. They embraced the gatekeeper concept once the 34 Act was enacted. So there was a big push between when the 33 Act was enacted and when the 34 Act was enacted to actually roll back the 33 Act. Wall Street did not like it at all and wanted to either weaken it or just get rid of the 33 Act altogether. Of course, the Great Depression was still happening. So on June 6, Congress and the president put the 34 Act on the books, and that created the SEC for the first time. And on June 30th, FDR appointed Joe Kennedy as the agency's first chair. Now, Joe Kennedy had been a big contributor to FDR's campaign. This was Kennedy's first major involvement in a national political campaign, despite talk for many years of him wanting to be president himself. So he donated, loaned, and raised a substantial amount of money for FDR. And a lot of people wanted to be the chair of the SEC that were part of FDR's inner circle. So Joe Kennedy getting that job was a big deal. As noted on this SEC Historical Society page, the choice of Kennedy for SEC chair scandalized a lot of people, a lot of Democrats across the country, many of whom assumed that Landis would get the job. New Deal liberal Jerome Frank likened the appointment to setting a wolf to guard a flock of sheep because Kennedy had been a part of a lot of the nefarious practices that led to the market crash in 29. So back then, the commissioners were heavily involved in the day-to-day operations of the SEC. They met nearly every day the first three months, according to the SEC Historical Society's website. The other commissioners, James Landis, who had been part of drafting the 34 Act, part of FDR's inner circle, He became a commissioner, and he actually became the second SEC chair once Kennedy left. And he was in charge of the supervision of studies and reports, as well as the writing of the regulations and opinions. Fernand Picora, who was very unhappy about Kennedy being appointed as a chair, supervised the trading division, the investigated arm of the SEC. But he lasted only six months at the SEC. He wanted to be more adversarial towards Wall Street than the commission was being. And like, and he was very upset, like I said from the beginning, that Kennedy was appointed chair. There were two Republicans appointed as commissioners, and both of them were highly experienced. Joe Kennedy sought out the best lawyers available to, to, to give him a hard-driving team with a mission for reform. 
And by July 17th, just a few weeks after he had been appointed as chair, they had, the SEC already had three functional divisions and it had hired one of the best senior staffs in D.C. That included William O. Douglas, who eventually would become an SEC chair, as well as a U U.S. Supreme Court justice, very famous one at that. Douglas targeted the practice of protective committees, the trustees who oversaw the many bankrupt companies out there who were giving preferential treatment to the people that committed the fraud in the first place. Douglas joined the SEC, having been one of the country's top corporate law professors. He was at Yale Law School, and that brought in a steady stream of Yale School grads. The head of the legal division of the SEC, John Burns, had been a Harvard Law School professor, and between him and Felix Frankfurter, who was one of his close friends, they brought in many Harvard Law School grads to the SEC. So for a long time, the staff at the SEC was thought to be the creme de la creme of all the federal agencies, the smartest of the bunch. Baldwin Bain headed the Registration Division, what we now know as the Division of Corporation Finance, Corp Fin, and David Saperstein was the head of the Trading and Exchange Division. Having said all that, the entire SEC was made up of just a few dozen people at first. So the SEC Historical Society's website has this list of all the staff, this is the commissioners on this first page, all the staffers that were part of the SEC in that first year, and as you can see, that includes the administrative assistants, the secretaries, <laughs> four pages, and not a whole lot of folks, man. So you can see why Joe Kennedy only lasted 431 days at the SEC. Not an easy job. Mm -hmm.